gentlemen, welcome to America's Auto Enthusiast Program. This is Auto World. And now, here's your host, Bob Long. Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for joining me here for another hour of Auto World. We're going to be uh, talking about oil with our oil expert, Dan Watson, who is standing by to tell you all about it. The telephone number for us to get a hold of us, and that number is 855 660 4261. My daughter Lucy has given me some inside information here, and it all looks good. So <laughs> everything is fine as she enters second grade next year. By the way, if you need classic car insurance, only Haggerty has the expertise and passion to protect your car how it deserves. Quote at Haggerty.com or with your local agent. Haggerty, for people who love cars. I certainly love cars, and so does our very special guest, the go-to guy when it comes to oil and lubrication questions, more than 25 years of experience, and a gentleman who knows so much about oil that he does presentations, he does YouTube videos, and uh, he is reachable himself by telephone and He's one of the largest dealers of Amsoil in the whole country. He has customers all over the place, so it doesn't matter. You can order from him, and it will be delivered uh, to your door, and in some cases free of charge. And don't be afraid to give Dan Watson a call. Let's go to the Powered by Haggerty Guest Lines and welcome Dan Watson. Hi, Dan. How are you doing? I'm good, Bob. It's uh, sort of a rainy day. I've got all this uh, moisture coming through the area. But, hey, uh, without the rain, we wouldn't have all these beautiful trees and flowers we have. So let it rain. That's right. Absolutely. And this, without question, is a very uh, important time of the year. I know my dad was in World War II, so I uh, heard all the World War II stories uh I uh, knew some folks that, that went to Vietnam and have worked with some radio people who were in the Gulf War. Uh, but you, my friend, uh, tell us a little bit about your military service. Well, I'm a retired uh, Navy lieutenant commander. I was a, one of those sort of unique kids. I went in the Navy at 18 and went into the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program at the an electrician's mate, and worked my way up to being a chief petty officer in that field of uh, uh, professionalism, let's call it that, in the nuclear power program. And then I was commissioned about uh, halfway through my career as an ensign and uh, worked my way on through the rest of my career up to lieutenant commander and retired after about 23 years in the Navy. So it was a great career. I have nothing but good, fond memories to look back. And on this day of uh, Memorial Day, it reminds me that, see, my father was a Marine. My father had passed away when I was young, and and I don't know that he would have forgiven me for just being in the Navy and not... <laughs> in the Marines, but I think he would have been okay with how things went in the Navy. But, no, you talked about your father was in World War II, and my father was a Marine on uh, Iwo Jima and Okinawa. So I saw some really uh, tough times and and hard battles with the Japanese. Now, I uh, it's one of those things, another subject, but I don't even want to particularly get into it, but... I just can have no patience with any of this, you know, disrespecting the flag because I know that my father was one of those men that saw this flag get raised up on the top of Mount Suribachi and uh, what it would have meant to those guys in the field. And I just, I have no patience. I have to watch myself. I don't, I don't like to get angry over those things. But I was thinking today about if folks, I just give them a little reminder of what goes on in today's military. Uh, President Trump, as he needed to, is is trying to work out something with Kim Jong-un from North Korea. 
And this is a considerable adversary with some very dangerous weapons. And I remember my days in the Navy, and I thought about it the other day when he made the statement, and it's a simple statement we all hear it, and the politicians run around with it where he says, well, I'm going to have to call off this summit, uh, you know, because the North Koreans are not, they're not being truthful and honest, and they don't appear to want to really do this. And so that, that's a bargaining thing he's doing, and I understand it. But, Bob, I served on uh, fast attack nuclear submarine and on ballistic missile submarines and then on surface ships. And when you're on a ship and you're submarine, let's say, and you're in the uh, Indian Ocean or even close to the Arabian Sea, somewhere in the Middle East, and you've been out there going on five months or so, it's going to take you a month or six weeks to get home, and so you've made that point in your patrol, and it's time to start heading home, and you're, you're about a day into traveling across the Indian Ocean, and when the president says that, there's going to be what they call an emergency action message that's going to come, and it's going to tell you to reverse direction, head back to be on station, because you have to be in a position to execute whatever orders the president decides to dictate. And so there were numerous ships in particular situations whose day was immediately reversed because of a simple statement from the commander-in-chief uh, in a negotiation type atmosphere. So even today, uh, the sacrifices of these guys out there uh, doing the job to, you know, you didn't have to sign any kind of uh, agreement to be monitored on the radio to make sure that you and I didn't say something politically incorrect. We live in a society with uh, freedom of speech, and we certainly exercise it. We go on the radio and speak weekly and use our, you know, our First Amendment freedom. And it's a thing that so many people take for granted, but we've still got guys and gals out there across the world in all kinds of positions uh doing their job every day to make sure that we can do our job, you know, when you and I <laughs> to chat on the radio. So it's just so easy to take it for granted. And I think I would just advise people out there on Memorial Day to remember that this day is not about parades and it's not about the next sale at the next uh, big box store. It's about people who were out there on the call of duty and who performed as a would have expected, and they would have told you themselves they were just doing their duty. But, boy, we're glad they did. Very well said, Dan. No question about it. So we salute all of our present troops in all armed forces and thank them for their service. And we look back at uh, all the folks over the years that we've lost, and it's, it's a lot of people. And... Uh, you can only think about those soldiers who laid down their their lives for this country. And I'm with you 100%. I think the National Football League was the most ridiculous thing. Here you've got these overpriced athletes playing a boys game, and yet they have the nerve to try and make some sort of political statement. I believe the NFL has banned that for next year, but that was disgusting when it was going on. Well, I, I can't help but uh, feel that way, and I know people would say, "Well, there's another side, there's another." This. And I just go, "No, it, it's it's just over the top." I uh, there's many things you can say that is wrong that the country needs to fix, but the fact that that flag should represent what is best about the country, everything that is good and best and honorable, and I would hope that everybody would want that because if you want what is good and best and honorable then all the things of racial animus and all the things we talk about would not exist. So take that flag for what it is. It is to represent that which we all strive for, not for the failures, not for the times when we've come up short, but for the things that we strive for, the best that America can be. Absolutely. More with Dan Watson around the band. This is Auto World. Giving your radio a broadcasted tune-up. This is Auto World and your host, Bob Long. Thank you so much for joining me here today on Auto World. We've got uh, a great guest as he's with us each and every week at this time. We've got uh, the man who knows it all when it comes to lubrication, synthetics, and 
a certified lubrication specialist for more than 25 years, Dan Watson. Let's uh, talk about something that we don't get a chance to talk about too often, and that is buying AMSOIL factory direct. Well, I'm glad we bring this up, Bob, because, you know, when I talk to people about AMSOIL and we get to the end of explaining some things, and really the question is, well, can I get this? Where can I get AMSOIL? Well, in fact, there are a lot of stores today that you can find AMSOIL in, and I'm working hard on many more myself. But AMSOIL has a program that has been around for many years that's referred to as the Preferred Customer Program. That program is similar to if you go over and become a member of Sam's Wholesale Club or a member of BJ Wholesale Club, those types of operations. And what it is is you're going to pay a fee to Amsoil, about 20 bucks a year, to be a registered preferred customer. Now, that gives you the option of buying Amsoil products at virtually at wholesale price. And that's a significant savings. If you were going to buy online, you looked at the product, and then you were able to buy it through the preferred customer program, you might save as much as 30% on the cost of that product. And you would say to yourself, well, is that worth it, though? I've got to pay a fee. Well, that's exactly right. If you have one car and you're going to buy an oil change, it probably would be just fine for you to go to a local store or go to a service center, get it done, whatever you want. But if you've got, you know, two, three four cars. Some people have four cars in the family and then a boat and a jet ski and uh, a couple of ATVs. So once you start expanding the amount of places that you could use Amsoil, all of a sudden that savings becomes significant. And if it becomes significant, the $20 fee is peanuts to establish the discount. Now, the other part about it is Amsoil sweetened this pot here a while back because if you buy uh, $100 or more, you're going to get free shipping. That's either straight retail or as a preferred customer. So uh, wholesale prices and free shipping, that, that's a deal that's really hard to beat. But on the same time, you really got to look and make sure that you have the demand because you don't want to have to pay more for the annual membership than you're going to save in buying Amazon products. But I usually talk to folks about that when they are talking with me uh, about buying Amazon and do the evaluation for them to tell them whether it's worth their time or not. And uh, that's what that program is about. And, by the way, uh, we're still looking for more independent dealers just like me. So if you had any uh, ambition to be involved in a small business, then uh, I can sure, certainly show you how to do that. And I might remind our listeners out there that, Almost every tax expert that you'll ever talk to when you're talking about how to organize yourself to pay what you should pay, your fair share of taxes, but to not pay more than what you need to pay, is that if you have a small business uh, on the side that you can uh, put some of the things that you do normally now become things done in association with your business, they become tax-deductible activities rather than just personal activities. So there's tax options that will save you money as being in a small business as you get started. And, hey, look, you know, I I started as a very, very small Amazo dealer and uh, continued to be with it, and it just grew uh, fantastic because the products are fantastic. So just wanted to let people know that you, there is an option, factory direct option, to buy Amazo. And all you got to do is ask me about it, go to my website, um, and Ask for the information. It's easy to do right on the website. Or call my uh, 800 number and say, hey, you heard about this on the radio. What's the story? And I can fill you in completely there. Sounds great. And certainly people love the opportunity to save save money. Um, and uh, this is going to do just that. Let's uh, go to some questions. And by the way, we are live. A lot of programs on the weekend are recorded during the week, but we are live. So uh, don't be a stranger. Reach out at uh, 855-660-4261, 855-660-4261. Or hey, Bob, let me, let me interject here for just a minute, too. 
We know that uh, the show is actually, in some cases, it will be delayed broadcast on some stations across the country. And you, person listening might say, well, I keep hearing it, but i got a question, but it's not, it's delayed broadcast. Well, we give you a website, and all you have to do, or an email, and all you have to do is go there and ask the question, and then say that you want to hear the answer on the air, and we'll be glad to uh, answer that question on the air. All you got to do is send it in by email to Bob, or send it in by email to me, or go to my website and ask it to say, hey, I listened to the show, and I want to hear this answer on the air. And then the next time you get that delayed broadcast, whoa, there's your question and answer for you right there. Perfect. Very well said. We've got a question from Bob in Sarasota, Florida, listening on the AM and FM affiliate stations there. And Bob writes, I have never seen any recommendations to change the rear end oil. Is this a fill for life product? I would imagine not, Dan. No. You know, really, I hate that term, fill for life, because some um, auto and truck manufacturers might tell you there's something fill for life. Every single lubrication manufacturer in the world would tell you there's no such thing as fill for life. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. we have a disagreement, but since the guys that make the products that go in say it's not fill for life, I would listen to the lubrication people more than someone who says you never have to worry about that. I will say this. There's probably not the amount of attention paid to the differentials, rear ends of vehicles that have rear-wheel drive about whether or not those gears need some fresh gear loop. But the truth is, uh, for an automotive application, uh, you just should never you'd never let that stuff go beyond 100,000 miles uh, because if you're using uh, standard gear loops, which most of these cars are going to be loaded with because the manufacturer doesn't want to pay a little bit of extra to put the synthetic gear loop in, then you probably would say, hey, at about 50,000 miles, I should service my differential. It probably only holds on a lot of these cars a couple quarts of oil, but it needs to be changed. Now, if you went with a high-quality synthetic like Amsoil or Mobile, then you'd be able to say, well, I can double that out to maybe 100,000 miles between changes. And the thing about it is it's an ignored part of the car. People don't pay any attention to it. But we got people now driving cars 250,000, 300,000 miles. And if you're going to keep a car and get that kind of use out of it, you better be changing that gear loop because what you'll find is the bearing will go out in the rear end. Oh, my goodness. We're talking about, at the very least, $2,500 just to buy mm-hmm. uh, the parts to fix it. You know, I mean, it's, they're not cheap, so it's so easy to change the oil and prevent paying those major repair expenses. So true. When we come back on the other side, more of your questions, 855-660-4261, Bob at AutoWorldRadio.com, Dan Watson at TheLubePage.com. This is Auto World. Don't go away. Hi, this is Jay Leno, and you're listening to Auto World with Bob Long. What's up, man? How you got it? Tell that there. Thank you very much for being here with us. It's always a pleasure for me to spend this time with you each and every week and look forward to it. And as uh, Dan Watson, our very special guest on the Haggerty Powered Auto World phone lines, uh, that uh, even if you're hearing us on tape delay, no problem. Uh, just send us your, your questions and uh, we'll incorporate it into a future program. So at uh, our network's uh, website, GCNlive.com, there's all kinds of tools, including podcasts, including archives, including listening on demand. And it's all free, so you can't lose with that. Let's go back to our mailbag here and find one here from Tom. Tom listens to us in Atlanta on a great radio station, WCFO, and he asks, can Amsoil recommend up to 25,000 miles for an oil change? Well, it's a good question, and many people just don't understand why you change oil to begin with. And let me be clear, uh, 3,000 miles, 4,000 miles, 8,000 miles, these are all arbitrary numbers 
that are established based on uh, testing, field testing, to see how well the oil is holding up after an amount of miles. Now, um, that number is established. The manufacturer puts it there if you have oil that meets a certain certification or qualification. Uh, GM was concerned enough about it to come out with their own CIFR Dexos, it's called, and the Dexos requirement was to make sure that the oils would have a robust additive package enough that they would support the General Motors uh, oil monitoring system, it's called, that tells you when to change your oil. Now, to make sure our, our listeners understand that that is sort of a misnomer. That system doesn't ever sample a drop of oil. It uses a a computer program to estimate the quality of the oil and the life. Well, if the oil is not of a good enough standard to start with, and that's a computer program that is set up to determine based upon the running conditions of the engine how long the oil should last, of course it's going to be inaccurate because it's starting with a product that's substandard for what it is, its expectation is for the computer analysis. So anyway, we're looking at oil. How can it go 3,000 miles, 8,000, 10,000, 15, or 25,000 the Amazon's got? Well, oil consists of, of two um, constituents. It's got the base stock and the additive package. Now, if the base stock is petroleum, then that's going to limit you to begin with for how far this oil can go. And the reason is, folks, is that petroleum is this wonderful natural product that's refined from crude oil, and it's a hydrocarbon base. It's got a number of other molecules in it that you can't get out because they came out of the ground with it. But it turns out that the stuff is pretty reactive to oxygen in the air, and so you can't change its natural characteristic. It will react with oxygen pretty readily if you leave it in its natural state. So the excuse me, the oil manufacturers, the guys, the chemists, and everybody get together on this. They put things in that petroleum oil that they call antioxidants, and they are chemicals to protect it from oxygen. But they get used up by the oxygen, especially at higher elevated temperatures when the oil would be the most reactive to oxygen. Those oxygen stabilizers, they are really just being eaten up in those conditions. So with our cars today running as hot as they run, it's really hard on uh, petroleum oil to be able to have any length of stability within the base stock. And when you react with oxygen, you produce sludge and varnish. So we're in a little bit of trouble elevating these thermostat temperatures and pushing this oil to higher and higher temperatures to be able to have enough oxygen stabilizers in it for it to have a long life. Now, if you move over to synthetic oil, you can have a base stock which basically is inert. It does not react with oxygen. So you're off to a, a terrific start of being able to say, well, wow, if I don't react with oxygen, I'm not going to produce varnish and sludge. Uh, what's going to wear this oil out? Well, now we go to the second component in both oils, which is the additive package. What's an additive package? My goodness, are we buying additives and sticking them in the car? No. When you, when you uh, produce a lubricant, you tailor it to the application that it will be in. For example, compressor oil will have certain additives in it to make sure that it gets rid of moisture and that there's no foaming in the oil. But a compressor does not have an internal combustion action going on, so it does not have the bright products of combustion. So it will not have certain additives that are put in motor oil to neutralize the acids that are produced in the internal combustion engine. So we're tailoring the additive package so that it will, in fact, apply to where we put the oil. Now, if I'm going to put an anti oxidant in oil, something to stabilize it for reacting with oxygen, I have to know how much of this that I'm going to put into it for the life that I want it to last. So in other words, I can create an additive package of my different additives, anti-wear, anti-foaming, anti-acid, antioxidants. These are all different additives that are put into oil. And if I design that oil that I want it to go at least 5,000 miles, then I will spend the money to additize or put the amount of additives in that oil 
it might take it to 7000 so that I've got a safety margin depending upon how the oil is used, and that's what I'm going to spend. You cannot ask a company that's in business to make a profit, some large oil company, to put enough additives into the oil for it to go 20,000 miles when they're going to sell it for a normal drain interval oil to be drained in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendation. They would be wasting money. The guy would get fired. They wouldn't stay in business if they spent all this money. It would be like buying a tire that you rate for 40,000 miles, but manufacturing it to the same standards that you make your 80,000-mile tire and then selling it for the price of the 40,000-mile tire. You would just go out of business. That business model would never last. Mm -hmm. So the additives that are put in the oil will be to match up with the recommended interval that that oil is going to be changed. So if I have a petroleum oil, and I know that the base stock itself can only last so long, because I can't, I just cannot put overwhelming amount of oxygen stabilized, and I can only get so much in there before I start to change the very characteristic of the oil itself. So the point is, I know that this is only going to be able to stabilize with oxygen, say, for 6,000 miles. Well, then I'm going to make the rest of my additive package to match up to that. I'm not going to overdo the rest of the additive package when the oil is going to be limited by oxidation. So that's how you determine these additive packages in the petroleum oils. They're fairly weak because they don't expect to last that long. Coming over to AMSOIL's Signature Series Oil, which is designed for 25,000 miles, we have the most robust additive package in the industry. And why wouldn't we? If you're going to say that this oil can go that distance, then you look at your base stock, and in that signature series, it is a high-quality PAO ester-based synthetic. It's impervious to, to reacting with oxygen almost forever, okay? But we still put some antioxidants in there just for those times when it might get in some very severe adverse conditions, and we give it a little bit there to make sure it's okay. But... That's going to go 25, 30, 40,000 miles. It doesn't care. But we've got to put additives in there to go a certain distance. So you say, okay, I want it to go 25,000 miles. I'm going to put the additives in this oil that will go beyond that. In fact, there's a safety factor in there. So if I say 25, it's probably got additives to last 35. But you don't know how bad the conditions are that oil is going to be in. You have to take worst-case scenario and put the additives in it that will last up to 25,000 miles. Okay, so the oil has the right base stock that will not be uh, destroyed through oxidation. The additives are there to go the distance. You can go 25,000 miles. Now, the next part is we'll just mention after the break is you better have some good filtration if you're going to go out for 25,000 miles. So true. Dan Watson is with us, CEO of thelubepage.com. We're learning it all, all there is to know about synthetics and lubricant uh, we were an email that we got from somebody in Atlanta Tom and uh, he was talking about uh, 25,000 miles for an oil change how can AMSOIL recommend that and Dan you were going to bring out the point about filtration and how important that is Yes, uh, we just talked about how if you will uh, use a high-quality synthetic base stock that will not be susceptible to oxidation, and you will have a robust or enhanced additive package that will provide all of the necessary ingredients to go the distance, then, okay, you're pretty good with this oil. Now, the problem is, in most engines, you do have to be concerned with whether or not your what we would call total dissolved solids or uh, contaminants that can get into the oil uh, in the manner of granulated contaminants. Can the filter remove those so that they don't build up in the oil to cause problems? And the truth is, a good filter can. So you have to have good filtration. Now, full flow filters, the kind that everybody uses that spin onto your car or have a cartridge filter, whichever type it is, these are going to be filters that can be rated anywhere from 20 microns to 40 microns. And remember, folks, that 40 microns is the average thickness of a human hair, okay? So you'd say, hey, that's pretty good filtration. Well, it is, but the Society of Automotive Engineers tells us that a lot of wear is created by particles that would be 
smaller than uh, 20 microns, okay, over time. That takes a lot of time. But remember, there's millions of revolutions going on in this vehicle over time. So anyway, your filtration, it has to be good. And the only thing I want to warn you about with filtration is that you have to be careful. When you see filters and they give you a rating and they call it the nominal rating is, let's say they give you a nominal rating of anything, say nominal 40 microns. Nominal means 50%, meaning it removes every other particle. That's not really what you want. But they'll use that nominal, and they'll say it has, it removes nominal rating of 40 microns. Well, they've told you something, but they hope that most people don't really understand it, but they put it on there because nominal is just an average 50%. When you go to a filter, high performance filter like the AMSOIL uh, filters, they are uh, efficiency absolute, they're called, because they have over 98% efficiency at removing 20 micron particles. And that's 98%, <clears throat> excuse me, not 50%. So they're catching just about every particle that's 20 microns or larger. They would catch 98 out of 100 of those particles. But the filter, <clears throat> excuse me, the filter also removes particles at a nominal rating down probably at 5 microns. Okay, removing every other one. So, but mm -hmm. Amsoil's not going to use a nominal rating because it's such a misleading, useless rating. And so, I'm just telling people to be careful what they look at on their filter performance. And you will, in filters, you will pay for what you get. When you buy a cheap filter, you'll get a cheap filter. When you buy a more expensive filter, you'll get a better filter because it's the filter medium that costs money, not the steel can or whatever's around it. And if you can put a filter together and throw cheap what we call cellulose or paper membrane in it, you probably sell that thing for three or four bucks. It might even might not even cost the manufacturer more than two bucks to make it. But if you decide you're going to go for a high-quality synthetic membrane and you're going to put that into a filter that has internal uh, bypass capability so that if it's ever clogged up, it won't stop flow. It'll open itself up and allow flow to go through to protect your bearings. And uh, it's got a thick enough can on it to handle 150 PSIG, you're all of a sudden asking for new things in higher quality, and you're going to end up having to pay for it. It's just that simple. And, you know, uh, there used to be an old Fram commercial years ago where the guy said, pay me now or pay me later. <laughs> and with filtration, that's just a true statement. So be careful in what you buy when it comes to filtration. But you need to match up high-quality filtration to go with long-drain interval synthetic oils. Mobile makes an oil they say now is good for 20,000 miles or one year. And they're probably going to sell a mobile one filter to match up with it, and that filter's not going to be cheap either. So you just get what you pay for in filtration. There's no uh, quick, easy, cheap way to get around uh, filters. You either buy a good one or you don't. Now, we had um, that. I think that answers the rest of that question, Bob. Yeah, no, very good job with that one. Let's move on to Terry, listening on WCCM in Salem, Massachusetts. And he wants to know if petroleum oil is highly refined and has the correct additives, why can't you extend the oil change to as long as the synthetic oil? I think we've answered that, but I'll just re-clarify. No matter how much you clean up petroleum out of the ground refined, it has what they call exchange sites on the polarity. It will react with oxygen. It will react readily. And almost the more you clean it up, the more oxygen, oxygen reactive it is. Okay? So that's the weakness of petroleum. So you can put antioxidants in it, but the best analysis I can say, Bob, is if you're going to make vegetable soup, you put the tomatoes and you put all this stuff in it, right? Everything. You got this, this yep. vegetable soup. Well, if I decide then that I need to add four pounds of carrots, into my vegetable soup, it becomes carrot soup. Okay? <laughs> so I can't add so much antioxidants that I displace the action of all the other additives. There's a limit. There's an operating band that I can put it in and it functions. If I get it outside of that, it interferes with the chemical actions going on in the other additives and the other part of my oil. So I can only put so much in. And I put as much as I can and that oil is going to be limited. It's the same thing with poor depressants. I can try to make it so that a, a petroleum oil will go down to 30 degrees below zero, but I'm going to run out of luck to try to go much further because I've already put all of the anti-waxing 
agents I can put in it. I can't put any more, okay? And it runs out. It just can't. So it starts to become a cotton candy when it goes below that. It just starts freezing up. So anyway, I think we got time probably to uh, hit one more question. And that question comes from John in Portland, Oregon, listening on KPAM. He wants to know, do European cars use different oil than American cars? I have a BMW, and my wife drives a Volkswagen Turbo Diesel. Good well, question. we got just a couple minutes, and the answer is yes, they use different oil. Why? Well, some American oils they can use. There's a number of AMSOIL oils that cross over and be used as European. There's a number of mobile oils that do that, a number of synthetic oils from castor oil that will do that. But the everyday American API uh, classification of SN or diesel for the uh, CK4 may not meet all the European specs. We have two big specs that are supposed to meet everything. The Europeans have five levels of specifications. You can get everything from the trash oil all the way to the super oil that would be similar requirements like Amsoil Signature Series oil in Europe. And the manufacturers are very different. Like, you can imagine Mercedes and BMW, they're not telling you that you can put the low-quality oil in their cars. They're telling you you're going to put the, let's call it level five, the best rated oil that they have in Europe. That's what you're going to use. So they call that out. And the Europeans have an a organization called the ACEA. And, folks, mm-hmm. it's French, but it's basically the Automobile Construction European Association, okay, in translation. And they have these levels of specifications. But manufacturers there are very, very much involved in in creating bands of higher level performance that they require in their engine oils. Now, the other thing is Europe, even before us, went to incredible lengths with automobile and truck exhaust systems for uh, atmosphere and for their, like our EPA, their EPAs. They have very sophisticated automobile exhaust systems, and if you use the wrong oil, you may poison it, and you may end up with a very expensive repair. Mm. So when you drive a European automobile, look in your manufacturer's, in in your owner's manual, and look for the manufacturer's specification, and then demand that the people, if you're not at at your dealership, demand that whoever is doing the oil change for you is actually able to show you that they have an oil and they can show you on the bottle or on whatever it is that it meets that European spec. If they can't show you that it meets the European spec, do not use it. Right. Do not use it. And if you want more information on the European oil, we make a fine line of them in AMSO particularly for that purpose. And I'll be glad to give you more information. And you can hit Dan up at Dan Watson at thelubepage.com to give out the uh, toll-free number as well, Dan. It's 800-370-2986. Thank you, my friend. That will do it for this hour of Auto World. I'm Bob Long. Folks, this is Bob Long, host of Auto World Radio, with great news. We have a new sponsor, Dan Watson, who distributes AMSOIL throughout the USA and Canada. Dan is one of AMSOIL's largest distributors. He's a former U.S. Navy nuclear specialist and a certified lubrication specialist specialist with 25 plus years of experience. You can listen to Dan every Sunday evening live at 6 p.m. Eastern Time here on GCNlive.com. Get all of your questions answered and ensure you get the best lubrication for your car, truck, boat, or really anything that moves. In 1972, Amsoil pioneered synthetic lubrication and Amsoil continues to provide the best lubrication money can buy. Get the best advice for the best results. Contact Dan at thelubepage.com that's thelubepage.com or call 800-370-2986 that's 800-370-2986